How can you increase the value of your business? Let's say you want to sell your business and you're not sure what your business is worth, but you know it's worth more than what your top competitor sold for. Well, I've got just the person to help us answer not only that question, but to demonstrate to us how incredibly important it is to give thought to how your business is structured, to think about what you're doing from a valuation perspective long before it comes time to sell your business. My guest today is a gentleman named Steve Baker, and he's the founder and the head of CE2 Partners, and he's gonna share with us how we can take our current business and put it on steroids so that when we're ready to sell it, we can command a premium. Please join me in welcoming Steve to the Inside BS Show. Steve, it's Thanks, so Dave. great to have you here. I, the first thing that comes to my mind, and you, you almost started talking about it before we started the show, so I want you to go right into that train of thought. How did you become the guy people go to to increase the value of their business? How did you become this guy? Well, we do, we do um, well, first of all, let me kind of start from the beginning. Um, I'm a former business unit president for a Fortune 100,000 or 1,000 company, uh, a diversified manufacturing company. Before going into gen general management, my career concentration was on commercial operations. So growing businesses, uh, both organically and through acquisition. And I've worked for four companies in three distinct industries. So, um, and four years ago, along with another former exec, uh, uh, another executive that I'd worked with, we, we started CE2 Partners and our mission is to bring commercial operation excellence and profitable growth to mid-market industrial manufacturers and distributors. So let me, let me kind of go into a little bit about how we define commercial operations, and then we'll get to the M&A piece here. Um, but we define uh, commercial operations really four ways um, uh, of, of, of being comprised of four different things. First, the overall market opportunity, including how customers are interacting with the company's products and services. Um, next, the strategic uh, commercial objectives for those markets. Next, the functioning of the company's market-facing departments. And finally, the company's channels to market. That's how we define commercial operations. So um, having said that, um, our clients are typically dealing with commercial issues related to business complexity or scale. And we bring the expertise um, here um, that will that will also extend to the M&A piece, and, and I'll get there in a second. But um, here are some of the ways uh, uh, we interact with uh, companies. An example might be that they're struggling to decide on uh, decide on and execute their strategic options. So we bring resources, investigation, data, insights to one compare them. Um, both in terms of what they are and what they'll get from them, and two, so the company can make can, can pick the best ones and make them actionable. Um, that's one reason we might interact with a company. Another example is their commercial business models need updating. So examples of that might be that maybe they, they want to extend into a new market or otherwise create an inflection point in the business requiring a new go-to-market business model or changes to the current business model. So again, we bring investigation, data, insights, and execution to that. Maybe their current model has become too complex, um, inefficient, or costly. Um, in, in some cases, and, and recently, uh, we've dealt with a company whose commercial business strategy was driving all kinds of inefficiencies and cost in the back end of the operations by way of SKU skew proliferation resulting in resulting from poor go-to-market decisions um, and really driving worker capital requirements. So we had to go in there and clean that up. Or, or maybe they simply need to regain their footing in a market or adjust to, to a changing market. Um, other times, companies just need data and insights on new customers or markets to execute a growth initiative. So this work all extends to early stage uh, M&A. So on the sell side, we work with companies to prove uh, and uh, to prove their ability to scale, which will in large part determine the sale price. 
So there's, you know, that's what the buyers are looking for, with the historical performance of the company and where can I take this. So in those instances, our work is on identifying, improving the economic and strategic value of a company's growth opportunities in meticulous detail. Uh, we want the seller's agent to get excited, the agent, whether it's a broker or an investment banker, to get excited over the company's growth potential and the quality of its investigation and conclusions, and we want that to show up in the target sales price. Um, also, along with that, is determining the commercial operations model that can deliver the growth and, and setting that model into motion so when the mark company does come on the market, um, the buyers can see evidence of, of progress in that direction. So, so that's really um, what we do and how we um, dovetail into the okay. M&A world. So tell us a story or even a couple of stories, uh, like a success story. Give us, give us one where um, you, you helped, like you mentioned complexity, right? O- organizational complexity. Give us a story about how you cleaned up organizational complexity and then give us another story about M&A. Um, well, organization complexity, a, a really good example is a company we work with that um, uh, was in a heavy industrial equipment business. Um, they were a manufacturer. Uh, through an acquisitive growth strategy that had been kind of driven, this was a division of a publicly traded company, uh, about a $200 million business unit. Through uh, an aggressive acquisition strategy by the parent corporation, they ended up um, bolting on these brands that make basically what they do, but they they sell, they may have certain feature differentiations and things like that, but they're all, when you put these four or five brands together, they're all pretty much pursuing the same 30% of the available market. So they- So like so they're, the all making, they're all making farm tractors, right? But it's, you know, it's one version of a farm yeah, tractor, yeah, a different yeah. version of a farm tractor, a third version of a farm tractor, exactly, and they're all going exactly. after the same exactly. customer with their three flavors of tractor. Not only they're going after the same customer, but they're going after the, it, within the farm tractor market, their types of customers. They're going after the same type of customer within the farm tractor market. Um, and, and, and over the years, that had driven a lot of complexity in their operations because every sales channel manager, brand manager wanted differentiation in their own product so they can sell against the other guy. And that created a lot of- and you, So you said, you said of, sales uh, complexity. Of, uh, they're they're, they're actively competing against other people in their company. They want it. There's fist fights in the parking lot is what's happening. Well, and it's and the business was set up that way. The business was set up that way, but eventually it became obvious of, of, of all the inefficiencies in that business model. So, so we went in there and did a couple of things. We, we slimmed it down from three, five brands to three brands. We repositioned those brands and, and brand work isn't something we usually lead with. Um, but, but really we repositioned the, brand work and the sales channels that accompany those. And um, and we gave them their own value proposition uh, so they didn't have to, and we eliminated almost 50% of the SKUs in the manufacturing process. So you can imagine the impact it made to um, to working capital. Uh, and just the the complexity for the product, man, the, for the production people, the supply chain people, all that. So that's an example of, of a commercial, of a commercial business strategy affecting complexity. I wanna, I wanna ask you something. Out that that really bugs me and because i see this as a consumer right so the parent company they're thinking somebody in the in the you know on the 27th floor of some building in new york or chicago is thinking hey let's go out and buy these guys that'll be great we'll be able to acquire their customers and and then they just acquire them and nobody nobody does any integration they just they just you know, wipe their hands and it'll be all right. Like, is that like, how does, how do they, how does, how does the street, how does wall street let a, you know, a business get away with that? That's just, that's not like the acquisition. Everybody's going to get excited about, but why do so many big companies and you can speak to this better than anybody. Cause you were in one. Why do they forget about the integration? You know what? I, I think that there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, the lessons we learned working so, you know, as part of, 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 of being an executive leadership role in three different public corporations, um, you do a lot of acquisitions as part of, the, of your acquisitive growth. And, and we learn, you know, the, the hard way. We learn by, by explaining to a board of directors how we screwed up for the next two years after the acquisition, right? So, so we learned the hard way 
about the upfront work you need to do and the and the business model planning and all that kind of stuff. But I think a lot of companies are you know they're 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 just better at buying things than they are at integrating things. And 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 that and the buy the buy exists at a certain level in the parent corporation or exists at a very high level in the division. But the integration right. happens farther down in the organization. Um, and you've yeah. got you've got managers who who really um, have never really been trained for that and 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 really don't know how to maneuver those waters, how to set priorities, how to deal with the people issues, how to how to rationalize channel conflict and all these types of things. So I, I think I, I think I about um, I and, and I'm going to I'm going to call these folks out because it was disastrous. I think about Fleet Bank. I mean, I don't know if you're familiar, like Fleet Bank was a great it was an institution in New England. Everybody loved Fleet Bank and they were bought by Wells Fargo. And the systems never integrated. It was, it took years. It took like half a decade for them to, they, and uh, Washington Mutual bought by Wells Fargo. Um, you know, all of these, all of these different banks, some of them, you still, if you punch in the routing number to do a wire transfer, it still comes up under the old bank's name. I mean, this is the kind of thing where, I, I just it boggles the mind as a as a consumer or a or a, an, a, an, a third party outside looking in and it really highlights the need for somebody like you to come in and you know you say to them all right you got three people selling the same thing here's what we're going to do we're going to segment the market and we're going to decide who can target each one and you're a genius and you're a genius because you've come in and said, look, this I can see this. You can't see it or you're too busy to see it. Right. I, and I, I think that's so, part of the problem. I think that some of these guys are just too close to the fire. They're too emotionally involved and acquisition takes place. Who's the boss? Am I the boss? Am I you the boss? You know, um, you know, when you get down into the into the commercial operations uh, uh, functioning areas. But that's you know that's luckily for us you know no that I think you're a net you're a, you're where, never you're never going to go out of business because people people need to keep acquiring companies need to keep acquiring other companies and they're, what they're going to do is let's just acquire them we'll bolt our name on the front and we'll call Steve and he'll fix it later I mean that's that's exactly what's going to happen you know I've known a lot of great companies that do really good work in this area but but for middle market manufacturing companies uh, this is in general generally speaking it's a weak spot for them. And it is a place where maybe they should get outside help, whether it's us or not, um, to get past all of the silos and the uh, ownership and the and the, the feelings and all this kind of stuff to really get a good tight in, in, uh, integration plan going in that makes sense, that really goes after the commercial objectives, the strategic objectives for buying it. And, and we get called in when, when they had a pretty good plan, but they gave the plan to people who couldn't execute on plan because they didn't have the skill sets. They couldn't, they 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 they, they kind of want to walk in, make everybody feel like everything's going to be beautiful, and 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 as an example, and then they have to deal with those. Can you downstairs. can you come in when they're like as the acquisition is being finalized? Can they call CE two? Can they call you? And can they say, listen, well, the acquisition is going to be finalized shortly. We we have two different and distinct cultures. We there's we know there's overlap. Here's what we want. We want uh, like a mediator. We want an independent third party to come in and look at everything and give us the plan for how we can make this work from day one. Is that something that you can do or is that something that you would do? Absolutely. And, and I think one of the things that makes us particularly good at that, Dave, is because we have career, uh, careers in operations, commercial operations, we understand... Um, we understand the implementation beyond just the plan itself. We understand the roadblocks you're going to hit. We understand the people issues. We understand you've got third party intermediary dis distribution issues. You know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of stakeholders in executing that integration plan. Uh, you know, everywhere from the guy who's have to build the products all the way down to the guy who's going to sell it that may not work for you and the customer who's going to buy it that needs to understand what you're doing and why. Um, and there's resistance, not intentional resistance, but there's 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 a lot of hand holding that has to go along along with that, and a lot of explaining and a lot of data based decision making um, that that the company, you know, even if they wanted to, they they may not have the skill set, or they they often don't have 
uh, the time. I mean, these guys were doing another job before they bought this company, right? And that yeah. that job was a full time so, job. When you're when you come into a situation and they say, "Hey, listen, Steve, we're we're thinking about a three year exit or a five year exit. We want you to we want you to help us, you know, spruce the place up a little bit. We want you to help us, you know, get ready for that." Do you come in and how do you how do you approach it? Do you do you approach it from an operational standpoint where you just immerse yourself right away, or do you do you talk to the customers first? What's what's the first thing you do when somebody invites you in to take a look at their operation to make you know to make changes that's gonna that's gonna improve the efficiency of the organization and get it ready for sale? Well, there's 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 two there's two constraints in the process that we usually bump into. The first one is um, the financials of the company. So depending on the size and sophistication, the financials and how the financials have been maintained can make it easy or difficult to begin to dig into where the growth potential is and how buyers are going to view the company, right? So, so, so that usually requires someone coming in and helping with that. Beyond that, um, you know, what we really want to know, uh, we want to do the work that the investment banker doesn't want to do. We want to sit down with the owners and, and you know, spend that time to, you know, owners are, you, you know, they, 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 a lot of them are, they, they react on gut and they, they're not, which is great. And they've been successful, but a buyer needs data. He's, he doesn't have the gut, right? So, so what we want to do is we want to go in there and we say, okay, talk to us about um, where you think this business can go and why do you think that? And, and, and then we'll know if we're dealing with a, a hunch you know, uh, or something that has maybe a little meat behind it. Very seldom do we see something that's completely baked out. Um, so, so we'll go to work there trying to um, uh, get as much information of the company as we can from that growth opportunities or that growth trajectory, get the junk out of there, find the, the really good stuff, and then we'll go out and start proving that. And that process of proving that is is it comes from internal data it comes from market research mostly qualitative more than quantitative um, it comes with uh, meetings with their intermediaries it comes with meetings with their customers it comes from uh, understanding their technology capabilities their funding capabilities all that kind of stuff uh, and we want to really drill down on that stuff so when a buyer comes in like i said earlier he's looking at a growth opportunity that's very well defined um, where where he knows exactly what it is he knows exactly the business model to get there and the business plan to get there. And he's got a pretty good idea of the projections in terms of cash flow, whatever he's going to get over the next five years. So that's that's what we really focus on. As part of that process, because we come in early, we'll also be hooking up the owners with certain resources. If they don't have a CPA that has M&A experience, we'll hook them up with a CPA. Um, if they don't have a broker or investment banker, we'll maybe begin to make those introductions. Um, if he doesn't, if, if they if they don't have a wealth manager, we'll begin to make those in introductions. Um, uh, you know that kind of okay. Stuff. So let's talk about um, goodwill, and let's talk about the the you know everybody thinks that their goodwill is more valuable than it than it than it always gets valued in an acquisition setting or valued in an you know in an IPO or when you're going out to get uh, to get funding. So explain to the folks who are listening, the folks who are watching, the nature of goodwill and talk about what you do when you come in and you look at customer relationships, you look at institutional knowledge, you look at all the things that we as business owners will say, this is what this is what our business really is. But then, you know, the, the business gets valued and there and people are like, well, you, you don't have a lot of good assets here. And, the, and the, the business owner is like, well, I got all these customers. And, you know, talk about the nature of goodwill and what what can we do with that to help when it comes to preparing for some type of an event, either a, a funding event or uh, an M&A event? Well, I mean, loosely speaking, loosely, goodwill is, is really what we're focused on because, um, you know, and again, loosely defined goodwill to me is 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 the the intangibles of the business that 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 uh, have value, right? So the brand, as an example. So what we're selling is we're selling the value of future growth, um, uh, which which of course everyone does in every M and A scenario, and we'll call that goodwill. Um, 
but but we we take that out of the realm of the investment banker and the broker who can can sometimes be a generalist. We're we're experts in manufacturing and manufacturing distribution, and we'll take that work on and we'll create a very solid piece of work. Um, and then he then the investment banker can step in, um, uh, uh, look at the value of the company through a different eyeglass and then worry about marketing the company and selling the company. So, so, so to me, that's all goodwill, right? That's, that's creating goodwill that has, that has value. Um, some people may look at that differently than me, but, but that's, and that's what about, what about intellectual property in a business? Like so, so much of the, so much of the value. So you mentioned brands, right? But there's uh, in manufacturing, there may be proprietary processes, procedures, um, how do you, how do you handle intellectual property and what can you do with intellectual property to make sure that we've captured all the value from some of those, uh, some of those assets? Well, we're not, we're not IP people, right? So, um, I mean, I can, I can talk kind of in general terms about Yeah, IP. I'm talking about like a, propri- um, so if I have a proprietary you know, process for manufacturing a widget. Right. And I know that my competitors don't have this. I bring it, I, I go and acquire a competitor, immediate efficiency. Right. How do, how do you, what do you, what can we do to package that up so that an investment banker says, well, you know what, if they go out and acquire the third competitor, then, and they, and they realize, you know, half the efficiency they realized when they acquired the second competitor, that will, that will, you know, drive earnings through the roof. How do we? So how do you? How do you help them do that? So I think that's something in, in, in our world that 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 we would be involved in, but would probably be fine tuned by the investment banker. But that's part of the story. That's part of the management pitch when selling the company is that we've got this proprietary, and you you've got to kind of take it. Uh, you you if it's proprietary IP, you've got to almost extend it to the next application or the next inflection point of that because the value of the IP is already in the run rate of the business, right? So, so what can the buyer do with that IP that the seller either hasn't or couldn't uh, to create a exponential effect on the value? All right, of the let's talk about now a, a Gordon Gecko scenario, an old fashioned Gordon Gecko scenario where you've seen uh, and you know I, I just I like to talk about these because they, they they're they're like sexy. So you 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 find a business and uh, two thirds of the business not good, but this one third of the business diamond right this is it this is where the value is give us a give us a scenario where you came across that and how you help them polish that diamond and get rid of the trash well in the situations i've been in um you know and and i haven't been in a situation where you know there was 30 percent of the business was gold but i have been in a lot of situations where 20 percent or 30 percent of it was junk right it didn't align with our go-to-market strategy. It didn't align with our, our, our commercial objectives. Um, so, you know, what we do there is we, we in our, those cases, we would just establish our value based on the part of the business we were interested in. And if there was some type of workout value to the part we weren't interested in, we either wouldn't buy the part we weren't interested in, but, but that, didn't, that didn't work very often. But, but we'd establish some type of workout value for the piece that we weren't interested in. Maybe we could sell it after we purchase the company, maybe we could just work it down, uh, whatever. But um, but I think that's a really important point because you know we're dealing with a company right now that has um, that when we first sat down with the owner there in the energy business when we first sat down with the owner, um, they created all these revenue streams that they have, right? Well, when you got into these revenue streams, you know, you got into a lot of stuff that wasn't core, that was 5% of the revenue, 10% of the revenue. And who's and if a strategic buyer comes in, they're going to be interested in the core stuff, right? And, and, and we had to sit them down and say, listen, it, it, you think this is a $20 million business, but no one's going to put value on that $5 million of stuff that you're doing um, kind of like a job shop. Um, they don't want to pick that up. So you're not going to get a lot of value for that. So you you, you got to start um, managing your expectations. You know, and that raises an interesting question. And the interesting question is, and, I, and I'd, love to, I'd love for you to tell us a story that supports this. When is the business only valuable to the people who own the business and the people who work in the business, right? Some businesses are only valuable in the sense that 
you know, they keep these people fed and they keep them fat and happy, but there's not going to be, the street's not going to place a lot of value on these. So it's better to keep your business private, better to keep it in the family. I want you to talk about that. And I want you to talk about it in just one minute, because I need to let folks know that the Inside BS show is brought to you by Sandrowski Corporate Advisors. For over 35 years, the, the folks at Sandrowski have provided expert client service to people all over the United States. Now, they're experts in tax planning. They're also experts in family office advisory. So if, you have, uh, if, if you're a person of affluence, if you're a high net worth individual, or if you're forming a family office, or if you already have a family office in place, Sandrowski can help you with the structuring of that family office, and they can also help you with the management of that family office. How do I know they wrote the book? The folks at Sandrowski have written a book on family office formation, structure, and management. So if you are the manager of a family office, and there are some days where you come into work and you go, I really hope I'm getting this right, you need to give the folks at Sandrowski a call. If you are forming a family office or you've just had a liquidation event and you find yourself fielding pitches from investors because you've got 50 million or 100 million to invest, that's the time when you wanna consider joining a multifamily office and the folks at Sandrowski can help you with that as well. If you need to reach out to them for these services or their tax planning services or business valuation services or litigation support, you can reach out to them by calling 866-717-1607, 866-717-1607. We're also brought to you by My Revenue Roadmap Guide. So if you're a professional and you want to build your book of business, here's what you need to do. You need to go to revenueroadmapguide.com, revenueroadmapguide.com. There, once you enter your contact information, you'll be able to download a business development plan that I've used with folks in the practice of law, with CPAs, with engineers, with people who are architects and people who are consultants. If you're a financial advisor and you want to increase your book of business, go to revenueroadmapguide.com, download that plan and customize it for you. This is my gift to those of you who are listening, those of you who are watching the show, it's my way to say thank you. We're talking to Steve Baker. He's the founder, the owner of CE2 Partners. If you need to reach him to talk about any of the things we've talked about today, you can call him at 630-240-2383, 630-240-2383. Or you can visit ce2partners.com. I'm also going to put his email address in the show notes so you can send him all kinds of email asking him all kinds of questions or pitching him on an idea that you have. No, don't do that. I want you to call him only if you're serious. I want you to reach out to him if you're serious and you have a business that needs his help. All right, Steve. So give us a, give us a story. Give us a success story. Give us a, uh, give us a story, something that you're proud of. Well, uh, first of all, before the break, you had asked about um, uh, right. companies. Oh, that's right. Cur- yeah, please. Okay. Right. Now, oh, that's you, right. Cur- yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Now, keep in mind that we're a commercial operations consulting group. So, um, well, first of all, let me take a step back. There's another founding partner to this business. Her name is Katie Hogan. She lives in Minneapolis. So <laughs> don't get me in trouble there. Um, <laughs> but um, but and she's, uh, she's a former public company executive just like I am. Um, but, um, but we're growth people. So whether it's consulting for that next inflection point, whether it's preparing the company for sale, um, we're, we're building content and arguments to grow things, right? So, so uh, you know, both from the seller and the buyer's perspective. So, so where we see unsellable companies, uh, I mean, there are a couple examples, and, and, and uh, I mentioned scale was one of the areas we work on. Um, if the company is unscalable, now that it can't or can't be scaled, and, and that could be because um, it's such a niche business that there is no really bigger business out there to aspire to, right? Um, it could be that um, the business is being run by five guys and they're all walking out the door when the business closes, all right? Or even a year after they close and there's just no way to, that the buyer can perceive a way to, to replicate or that keep that growth engine or that engine going after these after these guys walk out the door, um, you know. So those are those are two pretty common constraints to selling a business that I've come across. Uh, we had a client we helped prepare to sell for to sell not too long ago, where seventy percent of his business was with one customer. 
So there's, you know, that's a really big problem and that could end up in an unsellable company. So then in those cases, we can step back and say, okay, let's spend a couple years working on that. And, 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 but you don't, you, you don't, you're not ready to sell that company today. So, um, so, no, my, so my follow up question was, give me, today. give me a, give me a scenario. Give me a story that you're, that you're really proud of where you walked into not a situation exactly like we were just talking about where the business is unsellable and you pull a rabbit out of a hat and all of a sudden there's a suitor for it. But tell us a story of where you came in and you thought to yourself, man, when, you know, when I walked in here, I wasn't sure which direction this was going to go, but now look at this and they either, you know, received funding and, and grew to be bigger or they were acquired by somebody else. Give us a really good CE2 success story. Well, so I can tell you one that we're working on uh, currently that, um, that has got a, uh, a change of control um, objective out there a few years out. Right, and I, I need to be very sure, sure. a little bit vague here, but this is a sure, this sure. is a company that makes uh, industrial equipment. Um, our engagement started with going in and saying, and and they were looking for. They've had pretty good growth. Um, they are they are clearly middle market. They've had pretty good growth, privately held, um, um, but they 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 wanted to create that next inflection point in the business. So we went in there and we did assessments and thought, you know, we're where can you do this? So we, we kind of said, okay, you got X amount of business lines. Uh, you got these opportunities. Here's where we think. Here are three areas where we think you should concentrate on. Um, so we picked we picked one of those, um, and and the business um, uh, there were there were there were three constraints to that to growing that business line. One was. Um, working with their intermediaries and getting their e intermediaries, their distributors up to a certain level of performance um, and alignment. How do we get them aligned with, with your objectives um, and falling in step, falling in step is the wrong phrase, but how do we get them aligned and, and, and marching to the same tune? Um, the other, the other issues we had was there were two kind of back office issues tied to that, to getting that at next inflection point. One is um, they needed to renegotiate the bank credit facility. And then the other issue was they have, they have the, the number one um, component in their manufacturing process that's, that's equal to about 25% of the product. Um, they had a bad uh, contracts out there with the suppliers. All right. Now we're not, we're not, we're not contract negotiators for suppliers and we're not banking negotiators, but those two stood in the way of getting to that commercial business strategy that was going to take them to the next inflection point. So we had to tackle those two things. And in the case of the banking, we ran a we ran a, a structured negotiation with Chase and BMO and J, and, and 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 all the guys um, that turned out very well. That that increased their their credit facility availability by about seventy three percent. It reduced their annual cost by about a million dollars. Um, we renegotiated. I brought in a a uh, from our capacity partners. I brought in a really good negotiator, and we negotiated. Um, uh, the contracts with the industry that supplies them that main component that costs so much and got them into a much more favorable position than their competitors. Um, and uh, we are just uh, wrapping up our work with their distributors, getting them aligned and clearing the road um, for uh, investment at the distributor level, um, alignment at the distributor level, following the same metrics and KPIs, talking the same language. And, and getting that going. So that's turned out to be a, a pretty successful uh, project. Um, and and uh, we're very Terrific. Happy that's really well. great. So Steve, who should call you and when should they call you? When is the best time and who's the best person to reach out to you? Um, you can call me any, I'm on central time. You can call me whatever I want. Um, uh, you can go to our website. I think I gave you my cell number. There's a corporate number on the website and that'll work as well. Um, but I think, you know, I, I think the best time to call us is, is you know, there are a couple ways. If, if, if you're constrained in your ability to be successful in the market, whether it's uh, internal, whether it's market conditions, whether it's distribution, whether it's your pricing, whatever it is, you know, that's a good time to call us. If you're planning on entering a new market that's going to require investment or you don't know if it's going to require investment or better yet, you don't know what you're going to get out of it at the end of the day in terms of economic um, benefit and strategic, but mostly economic benefit will help you figure that out. And if you've got multiple choices and you're trying to decide which is the best one, we'll help you figure that out. Certainly, if 
selling your business is entering your mind right now, then we're, we can come in there and we can say, listen, one of the biggest things that buyer's gonna pay for is your ability to concert, sustain your commercial operation, growth, all that post acquisition. And the most biggest thing you're concerned with is to make that potential look as good as it can to drive the highest multiple in the sale. We can help you with both of those um, so that when you do engage a broker or an investment bank, and by the way, we can also help you pick partners, uh, your acquisition team, your M&A team, um, uh, when you are ready to sell that business and you are ready to reach out to a, a, a broker or an investment banker, all that stuff is tight and, and it's, it's believable and there's proof uh, uh, behind the Perfect. The and who is not a good fit for, for what you do? Who is not, who's somebody you would say, listen, I appreciate you reaching out, but we're, we're not the people who can help you. Is there an industry sector or a type of business that's not a good fit? Yeah. Um, you know, retail, healthcare. I mean, we, we, we helped a company, uh, we helped, we're a sell side advisor, not the broker on a, on a business that, that, uh, we can, we helped them sell to a private equity group that was, makes medical cards, but that's kind of hardware, but, but we're not on the technical side of MT. I mean, we're industrial products, manufacturing and distribution. That's kind of our niche in terms of, you know, we've had clients as small, uh, we, we, we're really mostly in middle market, but we've done some work for clients as small as $3 million. Um, uh, we, we, we completed last year a project with a three and a half billion dollar publicly traded company. Um, that, uh, that made uh, uh, types of heavy vehicles. Um, you know, the farther you go down that chain, the more the work seems to be strategic. Where are we going with the business? You know, you get that a lot. We get that in like the 100, 200, 250 million dollar business on down. When we get up to the, you know, the big guys, it's usually a very targeted project. I need to take this product. I want to change it. And I want to extend it to that market. How do I do that? All right. So, so that's, no, that's great. I that that's, that's true. That, that last example was, was absolutely terrific. All right, Steve. So now I'm going to give you just a minute and I want you to think of three takeaways that you want people to come away with from our time together today. Three quick points that they should remember that we talked about today on the show. While you're thinking of that, I want to remind people that our show is brought to you by Sandrowski Corporate Advisors. They're the folks who handle business valuations. They also do litigation support and forensic accounting. So if you're a professional and let's say you're a, a family law attorney and you're handling a really thorny divorce and you need somebody to come in and just look at the numbers and maybe one spouse is hiding something from, from you. You want somebody to go in and take a look around. Sandrowski can do that. If you're buying a business, like we're talking about with Steve, you know, you're purchasing a business, you want somebody to evaluate the financials for you or spruce up the financials so Steve can then go ahead and review them with you to determine where he can get some more efficiencies and get you more value out of that business. Sandrowski can prepare, prepare the financials for you so that Steve can then help you with your business afterwards. These are the folks who've been doing it for 35 years. They work all over the United States. You can reach out to them at 866-717-1607, 866-717-1607. Don't forget too, if you're a professional, my Revenue Roadmap Guide, go to revenueroadmapguide.com. It's there for you. It's free. It's your business development plan. It'll help you build your book of business, revenueroadmapguide.com. And Steve Baker is going to give us the three big takeaways today. Before he does that, remember, you can reach out to him and call him at 630-240-2383, 630-240-2383. The name of his company, CE2 Partners, ce2partners.com is their website. Okay, Steve, what are the three things we should take away from our time together today? Well, I think since we since we started this call on kind of an M&A theme, I, I think I'll, I'll, that'll be my first one. And, and that's the thing, uh, you know, proving, proving your the post acquisition growth potential of your company to a buyer is critical and it has a huge impact on how much they're going to pay you and this is not a discussion with the buyer this is not a discussion with the investment banker this is a process of investigation documentation projections proving stuff out and it needs to begin very early in the process um, the other thing I would say, if if you if you're dealing with a with a go to market issue or a commercial issue, um, and and you need uh, resources for investigation, data collection, uh, 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 professional commercial insights, 
um, uh, we're the people to call. Um, and the last thing is that uh, we are, while we, we think we're pretty good at advising companies, our roots are in execution. Um, we are, we're used to sticking around and seeing the results of the, of the recommendations we made and putting it, getting dirty when, when the execution may get rough or need some tweaking or you need, just need some handholding. So we're not just, we're not just advisors. We're also employers. Perfect. All right, Steve, thank you so much. That was Steve Baker. It, it was my pleasure, Steve, to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Folks, that'll do it for this episode of the Inside BS Show. We'll be back here again tomorrow with another show. Until then, I'm Dave Lorenzo, and here's hoping you make a great living and live a great life.